Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about passing your air brakes. For those of you driving a truck, a bus, or a RV unit that is equipped with air brakes, you're going to have to pass a, a air brake endorsement in order to pass your uh, to be able to drive that vehicle legally and to have insurance for that vehicle. So air brakes is an important component of commercial vehicles, bus, truck, and for those of you who have a large RV unit, it's probably going to have air brakes as well. Now, just before we get started here, uh, could people tell me why you're getting a CDL air brake license? Just uh, put a comment down there and... Uh, we can get started, maybe direct some of the information to those of you specifically who are getting a CDL air brake license. Uh, put that in the comments and we'll get started. Now, just before we get started here, uh, quickly, if you could turn off anything you got running in the background that might be interfering with the live stream here because it is kind of pernickety in the way that technology works. It's really great that, you know, <laughs> I can be streaming to everyone here but uh, all of that stuff kind of interferes a little bit so if we can get that turned off that'd be great and as well if you have any questions at all not just about air brakes but if you have any questions about licensing or learning how to drive or questions about defensive driving those types of things I'm more than uh, happy to answer all of those questions so just leave a comment and I'll check it as I'm going through the PowerPoint presentation here I have a little bit about uh, uh, the air brakes and a PowerPoint presentation for what you need to do for both the theory and the practical and what I'm going to do is explain to you simply uh, that air brakes on a big commercial vehicle or an RV unit are really not that much different from what's in your vehicle and what I've tried to do is is make it simple and explain it simply because uh, unfortunately we're teaching a 40 year old air brake course and these manuals and there's a lot of redundant information in it that is just simply not applicable in the modern day and age of uh, air brake systems that are essentially more or less bulletproof and if you want some more information about uh, air brake systems that are bulletproof have a look at the video here on the channel air brakes won't fail because it's very unlikely that they will not that they will fail in this day and age it's just it's just really not a reality that we live in so we'll get started here. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Uh, is the feed working all right? Okay, I guess it is. So we'll just move forward then with the PowerPoint presentation. Now, as you know, for commercial license, if you've got a vehicle equipped with air brakes, you have to get an air brake ticket, both in Canada and the United States, and there's other places in the world as well that you have to... Uh, Nigel says it's working. Excellent. Great. Uh, that you have to get an air brake ticket. And now the first thing I'm going to say and the first thing I'm going to explain, and I, and you may know if you've been watching some of my videos up to this point that I've rewritten the manual. I've written a manual and I'm working hard to get that published. It's at the uh, graphic designer right now getting the images put in and getting it so it's available on an iPad and available on an iPhone. One of the things that confuses students, I believe, is that we use air brakes and spring brakes to talk about air brake systems. Now, the I want to get I just want to get rid of the term spring brake because I think that just serves to confuse students because when you talk about spring brakes, they think, "Oh, there's another system on the vehicle," and there's not. It's simply the power source that's different. So, let's let's talk about your car for a minute. So, in your car, you've got three types of brakes. You've got a service brake, which is essentially the foot pedal. When you go up and down the road, you push down on the foot pedal and the vehicle comes to a stop. At least, you know, that's the hope and dream that we come to a stop. So <laughs> you push down on the brake pedal, that's the service brake, and the vehicle comes to a stop. An air brake system, too, has a brake pedal. You just push down on the brake pedal and the vehicle comes to a stop. In your car as well, and I know most of us in North America all have automatic transmissions, so we rarely use the parking brake, but it has a parking brake and you either pull up on the handle in the in the console in the middle of the vehicle or you push down on the pedal and you engage the parking brake and it's just a cable attached to the brakes on the rear of the vehicle and it locks the brakes into position with that ratchet mechanism it's kind of like a boat winch click 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 when you're turning it over and it won't go backwards it's the same thing as the ratchet in your car you pull it up and it won't go backwards it holds it in the lock position indefinitely until you release it again now, in the event, the unlikely event, that your braking system fails, 
you can use the parking brake as an emergency brake. In your car, it's manual. In an air brake system, you have the same thing. You have a parking brake and you have an emergency brake. And those two things are one and the same. In your car, you apply the emergency brake manually. The driver does. In an air brake system, if you lose air pressure in the system, the system will automatically apply the emergency brake. So we have three braking systems in our car. We have a service brake, which is the foot pedal. We have a parking brake, which holds the vehicle in place and definitely when we park it. And then finally, if the service brakes fail, we have an emergency brake. And the parking brake and the emergency brake are one and the same. So guess what? <laughs> air brake systems are exactly the same. They have a service brake, they have a parking brake, and they have an emergency brake. And the only thing that's different is the power source. How we apply the brakes is what's different. So in a air brake system, you have air pressure that applies the service brake. And it's the same kind of idea that's in your car. When you push down on the brake pedal, it's hydraulic pressure. It's just a different power source. Now, the parking brake and the emergency brake are both mechanical. In your car, you pull it up and the power comes from you. On an air brake system, we simply don't have enough power that comes out of our body to apply that brake. So they have large, powerful springs that apply the brake on the vehicle when you exhaust the air from the system. So when you're going up and down the road, air pressure takes that large spring and compresses it and keeps the parking brakes off, the emergency parking slash emergency brakes off. If you lose air pressure in the system, the springs will expand and the parking brakes and the emergency brakes will come on. Now, most of the time you're going to use those parking brakes as parking brakes. You simply pull the bu buttons out on the dash, you exhaust the air from the spring brake chambers and the parking brakes engage. Now, same thing in the emergency brake situation, you're going to go up and down the road and if you lose air pressure and you don't pay attention to the fact that you lost air pressure, <laughs> those spring brakes those large powerful springs are going to come on all by themselves. So the braking systems on your car and the braking systems on a large commercial vehicle are exactly the same. Now, just to relieve your tension or trepidation or your fear that air brakes will fail because the other thing about these 40 year old air brake courses that we're teaching in North America is, is they scare the they scare the living daylights out of you every weekend oh my god air brakes are so terrible you're gonna they're gonna fail you're gonna die you're gonna go down a hill in a fire in a you run away and you're gonna crash into a tree and you're gonna die in a fire inferno that simply will not happen in this day and age <laughs> just it just won't happen uh, all systems all braking systems, whether it's a hydraulic braking system that you'll find on your car or a light truck, and air brake systems are all divided into a dual air brake system. <laughs> no, no, Nigel, they're not they're not dangerous at all. They simply are not. They're bulletproof, trust me. The, the, the problem is, is these courses make them sound dangerous because we as human beings have long memories and there have been a few crashes in the 1970s and 1980s that people haven't forgotten about because a driver didn't adjust the brakes correctly and those types of things. No, they're not. So the point that I was making was is that all braking systems, whether on your car, light truck, or whether on a commercial vehicle or an RV unit, are all divided into two independent subsystems. If you open the hood on your car and you find the master cylinder, which is right in front of the steering wheel up on the firewall, and you take the cap off that, you'll see there's two chambers in there. And the system is divided front and back. So there's one side of the braking system is for the front wheels and one side is for the rear wheels of your car. And they have been like this since the late 1960s. So for almost 40 years now, 50 years, <laughs> Braking systems have been divided into two independent subsystems. So if one system fails, the other will continue to work normally. And an air brake system is exactly the same. If one system fails, the other system will continue to work normally. It is rare, really, really rare that these systems will fail. So just know that air brake systems and the braking systems on your car or light truck are exactly the same. They're divided into two independent subsystems, and if one system fails, the other system will continue to work normally. The parking brakes will stay off, and you'll be able to bring the vehicle to a safe stop. Now, saying that in a large commercial vehicle, if one system fails, the low air warning will come on, and it will indicate that you have low air warning or lost air in one of the subsystems. 
The other system will continue to work normally so long as the air compressor continues to work and it's really unlikely that the air compressor is going to fail. They just they just don't unless it's like a super old truck. But you have to understand that in the commercial industry, anything over five years old as a work truck is, is a really old truck. So most of these vehicles are going to be fairly new. So it's really unlikely that you're going to lose uh, air pressure, you're going to lose your brakes, even in your passenger vehicle. It just it it's just simply not going to happen. So what I'll do is I'll move over to the PowerPoint presentation. Like I said, I'll switch back and forth between the PowerPoint presentation and the uh, live feed here because I have it on two different screens. And I'll just answer any questions if you have questions while we go along here. So we'll just carry on here and the PowerPoint presentation so downhill braking so we're going to talk a little bit about downhill braking here using the engine brake uh, when you're using the engine brake in a large commercial vehicle you want a low gear with a high RPM so hard short intermittent brake applications if you need to use the service brakes that way it gives the brakes time to cool while you're going down the hill grade signs now it is important if you're doing downhill braking if you're running through the mountains as we live here in the rocky mountains on the west coast of north america uh, you need to read the road signs now most road signs uh, you can't really see that one in the image there but they're in a percentage so if it's a 10 percent grade that means that it drops 10 percent uh, vertically for every uh, so so if you're working in meters every kilometer you go forward it drops 100 100 meters which is a 10% grade. If you're working in feet, for every 100 feet you go forward, it drops 10 feet. And that's the way you read the grade sign. Now, most grade signs will have a sign underneath and that will indicate how long the descent is. If the descent is less than 10% and it's less than a kilometer, then just use the service brakes. Just put the engine brake on and just use the service brakes going down. Now, this sign here you can see is two kilometers. If it is more than 10% and it's more than a kilometer or more than a mile in North America, then you need to think about gearing down before you get up over the top of the hill. So, uh, grade signs are measured in rise over run. So, that's me, Rick August, PhD. I've uh, been a driving instructor for almost 20 years now, probably more than 20 years, and been an air brake instructor that whole time. So stopping distance. Now, for your purposes of writing your CDL air brake theory test, you need to know the difference between stopping distance and total stopping distance. Now, this part here at the top is driver's perception time, reaction time, brake lag time, braking distance time. That's total stopping distance. Now, stopping distance is just from the time that you put your foot on the brake to the time that the vehicle comes to a stop. Now, that's braking distance. So just keep in mind when you're writing your test that those two things are different and the ability for the vehicle to stop is going to depend on a whole bunch of things brake linings ability to produce friction and the tires traction with the roadway and I'm just gonna have a look here okay no questions all good so just moving back here one of the questions you will be asked on a CDL test is uh, two weight four speed you're going to be asked if you double the speed how much more power do you need to bring the vehicle in the, in the same in a stop in the same stopping distance so if you increase the weight you only need two times the stopping power if you increase the speed by twice you need four times the stopping power and essentially what they're asking you there is what is the most important factor in braking and the most important factor in braking obviously is speed as you increase the speed you need more and more braking power because it increases exponentially as you increase the speed of the vehicle and when you're driving a large commercial vehicle the point that they're trying to get at there is, is that you simply need to increase your following distance so that you have more time to react because keep in mind it's faster to steer out of an emergency situation than it is to brake so if if you have a bigger following distance, you're going to have some place to go because you need some place to steer into. Greater stopping distance, higher speeds require more stopping distance, trucks require more space to stop, and slopes or grades become a factor when you're driving a large commercial vehicle or you're driving a larger RV unit or you're towing a trailer. Whatever uh, contributes to a bigger vehicle, whatever contributes to more weight in the vehicle, all of that is going to affect and impact your driving and your driving distance when you're driving a large commercial vehicle. 
So braking, this is defensive stop, and this isn't just for air brakes, this is also for your personal vehicle. If you're teaching a young person how to drive, uh, you need to come to a defensive stop, and one of the ways that you do that is come to a complete stop. Just before you come to a complete stop, most of us who are experienced drivers do this naturally. Uh, just before we come to a complete stop, we release the brake completely, allow the body to settle back over the chassis, and then we reapply the brakes. If you hold the brakes until the vehicle comes to a complete stop, you're going to get a bit of a jerk there because the body is going to slingshot over the chassis, and that's just what that means there. And just check here and see if there's any questions. Uh, no. Um, Nigel, you're asking if we need more pressure on the brake before stopping in a truck than a regular vehicle. No, it not, that's not what that means. You don't need more pressure. You just need more space in order to stop the vehicle. So uh, it just you need more braking power and the reason that we have air brakes on large commercial vehicles is because air brakes provide greater braking force on a large commercial vehicle and that's one of the reasons why we have air brakes on large commercial vehicles as opposed to hydraulic brakes also the fact that we can't simply have the amount of hydraulic fluid that you need in a large commercial vehicle prevents large commercial vehicles from having hydraulic fluid so so air brakes the reason that they're uh, efficient on large commercial vehicles is because they provide more force but because you have a large vehicle you need greater space it's going to take more distance to stop the vehicle so okay just head back here so downgrades uh, most runaway vehicles on a downgrade are a result of poor braking techniques now the question on the test unfortunately the CDL test is going to say oh brakes are out of adjustment in this day and age it's very unlikely that you're going to have brakes out of adjustment because all large commercial vehicles equipped with air brakes have had automatic slack adjusters since 1996. It was mandated in 96 that all new vehicles manufactured after that date had to have automatic slack adjusters. And you can't have a vehicle pass its annual motor vehicle inspection and have manual slack adjusters on it. It just can't. It has to have those replaced with automatic slack adjusters. And automatic slack adjusters are effective in keeping brakes in adjustment. So. If you have a runaway vehicle on a downhill, it's because of poor braking techniques. So you need to understand the grade signs, you need to get the vehicle in the right gear, and you need to have the engine brake on full, and most of the time if you have it in the right gear and the engine brake on full, you're not gonna be able you're not gonna need to use the service brakes at all. And as well, engine brake technology and exhaust brakes have become effective, highly effective in slowing large commercial vehicles on a downhill. Highway signs, uh, the, here in British Columbia, we have these commercial signs that are specifically for commercial vehicles that weigh more than 5,500 kilograms. And that's gonna change state to state in the United States and other places in the world, depending on where you are. I know here in the province of Quebec in Canada, it's as low as 3,500 uh, kilograms for commercial vehicles and large vehicles that have to stop at these brake checks. Now, just know that some of these are warning signs uh, that you have to do that speed if you're descending a downhill in a large commercial vehicle that you need to do 30 kilometers an hour. Now just the other thing that I'll say if you're below 60 kilometers an hour or 40 miles an hour in the states activate your four-way flashes it just indicates to other traffic that you're going slow and that way they're they're less likely to run up the back end of you so uh, if you selected the appropriate safe speed or in the right low gear and are using the vehicle's retarding device you should be able to go down the hill without using the service brakes in this day and age that is definitely true that wasn't true 10 or 15 years ago but it is definitely true now i was doing some driver training yesterday with somebody in a new rv and it had an automatic transmission in it we come down over the hill he had a large jeep that he was towing around behind it and you know you had the engine brake on and it was slowing it on a seven percent grade at two kilometers so they're really effective all right moving on to pre-trip inspection so one of the two parts to most air brake exams you're gonna have to take a learner's uh, the learners includes a theory test and you have to do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle as part of the license exam and as part of that you have to do a pre-trip inspection which is, means inspecting the components on the vehicle secure not damaged not leaking so they're secure on the vehicle they're not damaged a rock didn't fly up and hit them and they're not leaking 
most of the components, 75 to 80 percent of the components on a vehicle, an air brake equipped vehicle or other type of vehicle are going to have uh, either air or fluid in them. So you need to check them to make sure they're not leaking. As well, while you're doing an air brake inspection, you have to check uh, that the brakes are within adjustment. Now, most jurisdictions in North America are going to use the pry bar method, which is essentially you put a pry bar on the put on the push rod. Uh, I'll just back up for a sec. You got to chalk the wheels, make sure you got system pressure over 100 pounds, and then release the parking brakes, and then you check with a pry bar. Uh, there is the applied stroke method, which means that you got to put the service brakes on and then measure the push rod travel, but there's only one place and that's the province of Ontario. If anybody's in Ontario, let me know and I'll talk to you more about applied stroke method. But most of the time it's gonna be the push, the pry bar method and you just put it in at the push rod and pull the push rod out of the service brake chamber and it shouldn't extend out more than the width of your thumbnail. Uh, half an inch to three quarter here in British Columbia and it's an inch in uh, United States and most states there. So first part of your pre-trip inspection, make sure you secure the vehicle, chalk the wheels, build system pressure over 100 pounds, and release the parking brakes. Now, if you have an older system, uh, probably new, older than 2008, it's gonna be uh, an older system that's not an ADIS system. An ADIS system is air dryer integrated system, and you have to drain the wet tank first. And the reason you drain the wet tank is to check the one-way check valves, and those are primarily responsible for dividing the system into a primary and secondary system. So that's the first step on an older system. On a newer system, you don't have to drain the wet tank because obviously it doesn't have one. So, all right, carrying on. Draining the air tanks, you wanna drain the air tanks. Uh, yes, to find the wet tank on an older system, you drain the tanks. Uh, the, the wet tank does not have an air gauge on it. So if you start draining tanks, the, the tank that does not drain, uh, drop the valves on the dash inside the vehicle is your wet tank. But most newer systems within the last 10 years, they're all, um, or sorry, within the last eight years, they're all gonna have ADIS systems on them. And the reason, the way that you know that they have an ADIS system is go out and find the air dryer, which looks like a top hat, and the air dryer is going to be very close, within close proximity uh, to the governor, the air air brake governor and have a look uh, on the channel here for the video on air dryers and that will uh, show you what an ADIS system looks like and that's your physical telltale sign. The other way that you know that you have an ADIS system is, is when you get in the cab and pump air pressure up from zero, one system will fill first and then the other system will fill. So that's how you know that you have an ADIS system. So inspecting components on the vehicle, secure, not damaged, uh, not leaking. You don't have any loose components on the vehicle. There aren't any air leaks and there aren't any fluid leaks because you have the wheels chalked and you have the parking brakes released. You have air in the system. So you want to check to make sure that you don't have any leaks, uh, air leaks in the system. You want to inspect the foundation brake at the wheel. Uh, brake shoe contamination, brake th shoe thickness if it doesn't have a... a dust cover on the inside of the brake and those types of things. So, Brake chambers, the sizes match across steer axles, the push rod attached to the same hole on both sides, and of course it's secure, not, uh, not damaged and not leaking, and there is no visible damage on it. Now some of these newer vehicles are gonna have uh, disc brakes on them, and a disc brake is much better than a, a drum brake because it doesn't ex uh, experience brake fade, which is one of the weaknesses of all braking systems. So just take note of the difference between those. Uh, brake drums and rotors, and again, airlines and tubing, no wearing, no structural damage, making sure all the lines are not hanging down and not leaking. So air tanks, again, secure, not damaged, and not leaking. The compressor, this is a compressor on a Caterpillar engine, and it uses the the engine's power source, it uses the engine lubricating system and it pulls air in through the uh, engine's main filtration system. Now, all of these manuals say that they're belt, some of them can be belt driven. <laughs> they haven't been belt driven since the 1970s, so it's not likely you're going to check belt tension. Uh, they're going to be bolted right to the side of the motor. And you can see the governor here right very close to the compressor here on this system. As I said, if it's an ADI system, the, company, the governor is going to be right close to the air dryer. I'll just check, see if anybody's got any questions. No, everything's good. All right. So 
So I'll just move across, uh, move away from the slide presentation here for a second. And if you just, if you're taking notes here, just write this down. You've inside the cab, you've got to do five tests, and then testing the governor settings. So you've got to test the minimum and maximum settings of the governor. That's your first test. The second test, you have to check the low air warning. You have to check that the emergency brakes apply automatically between 20 and 45 psi. You have to do a compressor test. So you have to test that the compressor builds a set volume of air in a prescribed amount of time. And most tests for most air brake systems are still 50 to 90 psi in three minutes at a high idle. And a high idle on a large diesel engine is about 1,000 to 15 or 1,000 to 1,200 RPM. And then the last test you have to do after you build to maximum pressure is to do a leak test and you simply turn the vehicle off, uh, make sure the brakes are the parking brakes are released, and then make a full brake application. And most of those tests are one minute. And it's the longest minute <laughs> of your life because you got to hold that brake pedal at full application for one minute and ensure there aren't any leaks. And you roll down the window and make sure you don't have any leaks. So engine running breaks your, uh, so you're in the cab now, you're doing a testing the governor and the first test on the governor is to pump down to above 80 pounds. Usually you want to pump down to about 90 pounds and then throttle up and make sure that the needles are rising and that way you're going to check the minimum setting of the governor. You continue to pump down, pump the brake down because when you pump the brake down you lower the air pressure in the system. Uh, key must be on position and after testing the governor you continue to pump down until the low air warning comes on. Now on an air brake test uh, they say that they have wigwags. Well they haven't had wigwags since the 1980s. They have, they're all buzzers, they're all lights. So the light and the buzzer will come on above 60 pounds. Uh, some jurisdictions it's 55 but most of the time it's going to be uh, 60 pounds. So the low air warning came on above 60 pounds and that works. And you continue to pump down it's between 20 and 45. Uh, the, the emergency brakes apply automatically. And then you're going to do testing air pressure buildup, which is essentially testing that the compressor builds 50 to 90 in three minutes at a high idle. And on the way up to 90 pounds, you're going to say that the low air warning went out above 60 because it should turn off as well. You're going to test uh, build to maximum pressure in the system. Most systems will... Uh, hit maximum pressure at approximately 125 pounds per square inch. When it hits maximum pressure, the air dryer will purge and the needles will stop climbing. And it says specifically in the air brake manuals in the United States that the air dryer is not an indicator that the system is at maximum pressure. And the reason that is, is if the governor is faulty, it will still signal the air dryer to purge. So they want you to check that in fact the governor is working at maximum pressure. So you need to check that the pressure is between 100 and 135 pounds and that the needles have stopped climbing. That's how you know it's at maximum pressure. And that can be a bit difficult because the wording is very specific in terms of what they want you to say at maximum pressure. So you say at maximum pressure, I hear the air dryer purge. I see that the needles have stopped climbing between 100 and 135 pounds per square inch. Therefore, I know that the system is at maximum pressure and the governor has put the compressor into the unload phase. So that's how you know that the system is at maximum pressure. When the system is at maximum pressure, make sure that you have the parking brakes off. You have over 100 pounds of pressure in the system. You make a full brake application and you hold for one minute and you time and you're not allowed in a single unit, a straight truck, an RV unit or a bus more than three pounds in a minute. Now, if you've got a tractor trailer unit, you're allowed to lose four pounds. And if you've got a truck and two trailers, you're allowed to lose six pounds. And that's the five in-cab checks that you have to do. Minimum and maximum setting of the governor. Low air warning. Make sure that the emergency brakes come on between 20 and 45. Do a compressor test uh, 50 to 90 within three minutes for the most part. At a high idle, go to maximum pressure and then do a leak test. So that's what you do to test in the cab and then the last part of your test is you're going to do a tug test on the parking brakes so you're going to apply the parking brakes put it in a low gear and then try and move forward the vehicle doesn't move the parking brakes are working and then you release the parking brakes and move the vehicle forward and apply the service brakes and you know that the service brakes are working so I'll just do a little review here with some questions that I have how long should it take for the pressure to build between 50 and 90 
should take three minutes. Most tests to test the compressor are three minutes. There's only one other test that I know, and if anybody's, like I said, if anybody's in Ontario, I can tell you what that test is, but most tests are 50 to 90 within three minutes. What is the first step of when conducting a pre-trip inspection? It's always chalking the wheels. You want to make sure that the vehicle is secure. When you're working under, in, and around the vehicle, make sure that you have the vehicle secured because you do not want to get injured by having that vehicle roll over you. And, you know, it's pretty tough to finish a road test with a truck on your chest. So put the wheel chocks in. What is the minimum pressure that the governor should return the compressor to the loading stage or the load phase or cut-in phase that it's some, sometimes called? Minimum 80 PSI. If it doesn't return it by 80 PSI, the vehicle is out of service. What At what pressure should the low air warning activate above 60 pounds? The low air warning, which is a light and a buzzer, always activates above 60 pounds. How many pounds are you allowed to lose on a leak test in a single vehicle? You're allowed to lose in one minute, three pounds. So it's three, four, six. Three pounds for a single unit, four pounds for a truck and trailer, and six pounds for a uh, truck and two trailers. And if you're in Alberta, uh, it's a two-minute leak test, so make sure you just know the numbers for that. All right, and heading back here, I'll have a look and see if anybody has any questions. Nyjah, you wanted to know if your practice used school bus, will it help to create a checklist and use it on the test to make sure the air pressure testing is correct? Unfortunately, Nyjah, if you're doing an air brake test you have to do it from memory so you will need to practice this and if you're having difficulty with doing that on your own I do suggest you go to a driving school and get a commercial driving instructor to be able to help you with that because you you can't have a checklist you got to have this in your head and you got to be able to do it for the driving examiner when you're taking your test so know that that you can't you can't have a checklist with you unfortunately now saying that uh, if you head over to our website, click the link below the video here, and I later today, I don't have it right now, but sign up for the newsletter, and I'll send you an email, and I'll attach uh, an air brake pre-trip inspection list for you for saying thanks for showing up for the, uh, the webinar today and the information. And if you have any questions at all about air brake systems or getting your license, getting your commercial license, by all means, drop me an, an email or leave me a comment here on the YouTube channel and I'll be more than happy to help you out, answer your questions, get you going as a commercial driver here and help you to be successful in passing your license. And if anybody has any questions at all, by all means, leave them down in the comment box. I'm more than happy to uh, help you out to get you going here in terms of air brakes and those types of things and be successful in getting a commercial license and getting moving up and down the road and making more money. Uh, so, Hey X, uh, yeah, you got any questions about air brakes, commercial vehicles, uh, driving commercial vehicles, passing a road test, those types of things, I'm more than happy to help you out. We got a bit of time here. Um, and like I said, there's lots of great information over on the website, there's lots of great information here on the YouTube channel. And I do try to answer questions and comments uh, every day, uh, some days, a couple of days, but for the most part, I try and get back within 24 hours on that. <laughs> you know, as like all of us, life is pretty busy for us, but uh, you know, I do what I, I, I really try and make that a priority in my, in my day. So, so if you don't have any more questions, uh, we'll leave it there. And thank you so much for showing up. Uh, good luck on your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now.